thank you for joining us for our first FSK from home in 2021. I am Margot Copera, the public programs manager here at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. And I want to thank everyone who has joined us today and those who have donated to our FSK from home giving challenge so far this year. We have raised nearly $600 for this program today. Thank you for your incredible support. And it really makes a huge difference and it, a big impact on all of our work. Our goal this year is to raise $3,000 from home. And if you would like to donate during this program, check out the chat um, for the donation link. So this spring for our FSK season, we will pull back the curtains in our collection, connect with MCHC staff and our colleagues as we reveal the stories behind the objects we preserve, interpret, and display. Today, Mark Letzer, MCHC president and CEO, We'll be in conversation with early Baltimore historian Lance Humphreys for Painting an American Grace, Mary Ann Caton Patterson. So with that, I will leave it to you, Mark, to introduce Lance. Thank you very much, Margo. And thank you, Lance, so much for being here. We are delighted to have you, Lance Humphreys. Uh, he is the executive director of the Mount Vernon Place Conservancy and also known very well as an art historian at large. Lance has done work on Robert Gilmore, um, uh, early um, Maryland collector, as well as a founder of the original Maryland Historical Society, which is now the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Lance is also a, a very versatile art historian and uh, very uh, noted. Uh, work in Baltimore painted furniture as well as many other mediums. So welcome Lance, we're delighted to have you here to discuss this amazingly new acquisition for the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Thanks for having me, Mark. I think I, didn't I give the first ever Francis Scott Key lecture? You yes. did on Robert Gilmore himself. And I also, I, I do wanna add, thank you for taking your lunch hour to do this with oh, us no here problem. today. Um, that first lecture was live, so you know things are a little different here, but that's okay. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, this is an, a fun topic uh, and a, certainly an amazing acquisition that the Maryland. It's going to be hard for me to say Maryland Historical. Uh, you know, you know where we are. I anyway, do. I, we do. We can we can start the pictures. Um, as some of you know, I I'm very serious about what I do in my scholarship. Um, I do often like to have a little humor in my presentations, but since I can't tell if you're laughing at home, I don't know what to do. So <laughs> we'll just see how it goes and hope you'll enjoy the program. Huh? Exactly. exactly. All right. Oh, thanks. We just got, we can, you can do emojis. We love emojis. Thank you. That's, thank you, Elaine. <laughs> so um, let's All right. Let's start, start the, the slideshow. Slide Okay. Yes. So I am uh, really pleased to be here today. Um, well, we're working on our slides here. One second. Uh, there we I'll go. Talking. Um, this acquisition, the recent acquisition by the Maryland Center um, of this incredibly beautiful portrait of Mary Ann Caton, uh, later known as Mary Ann Caton Patterson, and then later as uh, the Marquinhos Wellesley. And it was really exciting for me um, with Mark a couple of months ago when the painting first came on site. As an art historian, it's always exciting to see the back of an object. And I think that, uh, you know, this is an incredibly beautiful painting. Actually, it's in really great condition considering it's uh, really 200 years old. And, but it's always interesting to see what the back of a painting is going to reveal. And so when we looked, uh, this painting was last known or really seen about 50 years ago when it was in the bicentennial exhibit, anywhere so long as there'd be freedom, uh, which was a big uh, production of, of various institutions here in town. We can go to the next slide actually. And she was included um, in that exhibit. And it was believed at the time that this portrait was painted after uh, she went back to England 
a second time, we need to kind of quickly map out that Marianne and her three sisters, um, three which we'll talk about in a minute, went to England between 1816 and 18, and then she came home and her sisters stayed in England and married uh, the British aristocracy. Marianne did come home. She was married at the time to Robert Patterson, which we'll talk about. But then after he died in 1822, she went back. And <clears throat> this portrait at the time, you know, nearly 50 years ago, was thought to be from when she returned to England. Um, but what we learned when we finally saw the painting in person, if we could see the, the back here, um, is there is an inscription on the reverse of the canvas, which uh, a wonderful conservator, probably 40 or 50 years ago, left visible for us to see. And it's very dark, uh, very early hand, you, but it says here, Mrs. Mary Ann Patterson deposited with Richard Caton. And what was really fascinating about this inscription is that obviously at the time she's painted, um, you know, the front, um, she was Mrs. Mary Ann Patterson. Well, she was only Mrs. Mary Ann Patterson until 1823, or actually 1825, when she married uh, the Duke of Wellington's brother when she went back. But we know that here in Baltimore in 1823, at the time she goes back, she leaves a portrait of herself at, here in Baltimore. So what this means is that this portrait was actually painted during her first trip to uh, England, you know, probably in, 18, in 1817, as we'll talk about in a minute. And that at the time she's painted, she was Mrs. Robert Patterson. So that really kind of changes, um, you know, the understanding of when this period is, this painting is from in her life. If we could go to the next slide here. While she was in England this first time, um, she and her sisters met the Duke of Wellington through various social connections. And even more remarkably, uh, the Duke of Wellington here on the left by Sir Thomas Lawrence as well, he commissioned a portrait of himself to give to her uh, which she brought back with her in 1818, uh, back here to Baltimore. So these two pictures she brought back with her in 1818 to Baltimore. And he also um, commissioned a portrait of her that he kept for himself, which is in the next slide. So this very unusual circumstance that she was painted on the right in a picture for herself, and he commissioned this portrait on the left that he kept for himself. Um, I, they're very similar portraits, but I think if you look at the one on the left, uh, I think it, uh, we described it in 20, the 21st century that she's kind of making love to the camera there. She is very uh, wistful and these really super dreamy eyes. And what is, what is interesting about this is that uh, Marianne was married at the time to Robert Patterson and um, as was the, the Duke, I think, was married at this time. There is no indication that anything was going on between them, although he was clearly enamored of her. It was common for people to exchange miniatures of themselves uh, as kind of tokens of, you know, friendship and love and, uh, and memory. But full-size portraits by Sir Thomas Lawrence is, you know, is, you know a little higher notch than just a miniature. So it's an interesting story that then, and um, that he was clearly enamored of her in some way, so much so that he wanted his portrait. Um, if we could go to the next slide. So what we're gonna talk a little bit about today is um, who was Mary Ann Caton Patterson, later uh, married to one of the British aristocracy herself. Uh, she was the, one of the daughters of Richard Caton and Mary Carroll. Um, Mary Carroll being one of the children of Charles Carroll of Carrollton. Um, I'm just kind of outlining here the, the children that these folks had. Um, Mary Carroll, was, one of her siblings was Charles Carroll of Homewood. You all probably know about Charles Carroll of Homewood. And then one of her sisters that lived to adulthood was Emily Harper. Um, and Mary Ann was one of uh, well, obviously one of Richard Caton and Mary's children, one of four daughters, as we mentioned a little bit ago. And three of those daughters went to England in 1816 with her. 
uh, and Emily, their daughter, um, <clears throat> stayed home here in Baltimore. Um, <clears throat> Richard Caton had arrived from England in the mid 1780s and married Mary Carroll. His father-in-law, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, was um, a little dubious about this marriage. Richard was a little uh, brash and actually in, in 1802, he went bankrupt, uh, which was not common, but it wasn't uncommon with really very wealthy people. Uh, so that was kind of a little struggle there. And then really for the rest of Mary, Mary Carol's life, Mary Carol Caton, a lot of things were put in trust for her so that uh, they were kind of beyond, beyond the reach of any of Richard Caton's uh, foibles in, in the economic world. Um, <clears throat> So on the other side, uh, thanks for the comment about Robert Patterson. Now here's, here's the real bummer of this story is Mary Ann, uh, who marries uh, Robert Patterson, who I'll talk about that in a minute. Unfortunately, there is no portrait of Robert Patterson. So I've decided that, that he is uh, Mr. Darcy uh, from Pride and Prejudice. Uh, by, I think you all recognize who that is just to kind of have a stand-in for this, this man who married Marianne Caton because it's, it's frustrating not to be able to kind of put a face to these images. Um, this family, and Mark can kind of help fill out the pieces here with the, the Pattersons. Um, Robert was one of the children of William Patterson and Dorcas Spear, um, probably best known for their uh, infamous, uh, famous or infamous daughter, Elizabeth Patterson. Um, they, the Pattersons had 13 children. Um, I'm kind of suggesting here by those little short lines that about half of them died as children or at a very young age. And, you know, it's a very large family, but still a lot of uh, mortality in their children. And so only about four or five actually reached adulthood, including Robert Patterson, who, even though he married uh, Marianne in 1806, um, he died in 1822 and they didn't have any children together. So he had a very, he lived to be an adult, but uh, you know, died quite young in the scheme of things. Now, Elizabeth, as uh, uh, Mark, Mark when was the show that you all did in, was it four years ago? 2013, 2013 oh. and it's, it's oh. still up. The, the wow. exhibition on um, Elizabeth Patterson Bonaparte, yes. Yes, uh, woman of two worlds, correct? And, um, there's lots to learn about Elizabeth. She had a very colorful life in 1803. She married Jerome Bonaparte uh, while he was here in the United States. He was the brother of Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, and as you all probably know, I mean, Alexander Deutsch has written about it and other folks, um, they, they had one, child, one child, Jerome, and Elizabeth was on her way to France to kind of meet up with mid, meet up with Jerome and she was denied entry into France by Napoleon who had become uh, emperor in the in the meantime so she went to England and had their daughter um, Jerome known as Beau uh, and um, son. son I'm sorry son correct <laughs> and and you know her life spins off into this very complex web uh, for the rest of her life um, we don't know a lot about Robert Patterson, like the other Patterson sons. Um, William was trying to set all of his sons up with houses in town, uh, country estates or farms or plantation. Uh, Robert was given a farm called Tuscarora out near Frederick. Um, his, houses in, his houses in town are a little hard to kind of pin down because they seem to have moved around a lot, but um, William Patterson, the father, was not only dealing with Elizabeth Patterson, his, his daughter getting married in 1803, his eldest son, William, was getting married in 1804. And so there's a lot of new families that they're trying to uh, kind of place into their households. And the same thing is happening on the Carroll side, other than with uh, Mary, who was older than her siblings, Charles Carroll of Homewood. But in 1801, 1802, Charles Carroll of Carrollton is <clears throat> setting up Charles Carroll of Homewood in his Homewood house that he pays and a house in town, which we'll talk about in a minute, as well as Emily, who's also getting a house in town. So these patriarchs of these, <clears throat> excuse me, families are in this 1800 to 1807 period 
uh, really expending a tremendous outlay in cash. They were clearly some of the wealthiest people, you know, I would say in the top 10 here in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and Charles Carroll of Carrollton probably in, even in the United States. So it's a very complicated web. Um, just we'll dip back into it, but it's, it is amazing that um, Marianne, who we talked about, is in London. She's meeting the Duke of Wellington in you know, 1817, who defeated Napoleon at, <clears throat> at Waterloo. And here is Elizabeth Patterson, who is basically Napoleon's quasi sister-in-law, although he had their marriage annulled. So these two women were, were basically um, allied with um, major rivals in the world, kind of the European political stage. Mark, do you have anything Lance, else? I do, I, I, I find it Lance that this is, when you have all these, both sides of the family set up here and you think of, okay, so here is Elizabeth Patterson Bonaparte uh, whose brother-in-law Napoleon is defeated by Marianne's, you know, infatuate whatever you want to call the Duke of Wellington. Yes. How, and she's also the godmother of Jerome Bonaparte, the, the Betsy son. So you have this incredible web uh, and looking at this and all these connections, you know, not only local Maryland, but also international and how they transfer all the way over to England. Uh, and France as well. So it, it's a fascinating look at this, uh, you know, kind of like a microcosm. Well, I think that, that that kind of points to, and we'll get to, we'll talk about a little bit with the portrait, it's that <clears throat> these folks were, you know, I think that there's perceptions that early Americans were, you know, a bunch of people with straw in their teeth and things like that. Um, but that these people were really living life on a very big stage uh, that was broader than their immediate, <clears throat> excuse me, immediate community. And, uh, you know, and it was, in a, and this happens to be a really important stage that, they, that both of these women um, got involved with from little, little, little old Baltimore, Maryland. So we can move on. So that's kind of a little blurb about who these two sides of the family were. Um, Marianne grew up here in town um, in Baltimore in, uh, if we could advance to the next slide. Um, her father, when he married Mary Carroll, he became very, in, whoops, if we could go back a minute. It, he became very invested in developing in the old town area of Baltimore, which is across, I'm sorry, to the next slide. Um, the old town area right here, uh, you can see this is the Poppleton map from 1822. You, uh, you obviously hope can rec recognize the Inner Harbor. There's Pratt Street. Uh, Baltimore Street is the big street kind of in the middle there. Um, and this red area to the uh, right of the Jones Falls is where uh, Richard Caton, uh, probably with money that uh, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, at least in part, supplied to him, was buying a lot of uh, properties. And there were empty lots really at that time, not heavily developed in the 1790s and trying to develop houses. We, so Mary Ann would have been living with her father and mother, uh, actually in a house on Plowman Street, a very small street in that area in the early 1790s until uh, the mid 1790s when Richard Caton with uh, Charles Carroll's money, we can advance to the next slide, um, developed a row of houses. And if we look here, um, this is looking south on the Jones Falls, that bridge. This painting is in uh, your collection by Francis Guy, probably about 1803. That's the Baltimore Street Bridge crossing there. And there in the middle distance, you can see uh, kind of a long row of buildings with back buildings. If we advance one slide, they'll show exactly where we're talking about. And this row, Richard Caton, 1794-96, um, developed. Uh, certainly in conjunction with Charles Carroll of Carrollton because they're both associated with it financially. And this is a place that after they left their first house, Richard Caton and, and the, the four daughters, uh, they moved in here. Um, it has been gone for a long time, if we go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Peter Perry, based on the one extant house, which is there on the right, shot in the 1930s, recreated what this row looked like in you know, 1795. Um, interestingly, Charles Carroll of Homewood, it's little known that he's so associated with his house, his country house, but 
he uh, lived in the second house from the right here for a time. Um, he didn't always live at uh, Homewood House. He had a, a house in town like most wealthy Baltimoreans. And over time, um, his sister Mary and Richard Caton lived in the third house from the right. And then in 1811, in a kind of non-related um, <clears throat> moment, uh, Robert Patterson, Mary Ann's um, husband, buys for uh, Elizabeth Patterson the, the house on the far right. Um, it doesn't look like she ever lived there. She, she bought it probably as an investment. Um, and, and, but then doesn't just, she's, she's so peripatetic at this time, it's, it's hard to pin her down. I don't think that she ever lived there, but she owned it for quite some time as an investment. So this is where um, Mary, uh, Mary Ann would have been at the time her parent, she's, her, she's going off on her trip. We can go to the next slide here. Um, and to really give you a sense of this, because it's so hard to understand Old Town these days, this is the Carroll Mansion, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, that row was on that corner opposite there. You, know, you can see where that white car is crossing Front Street. This row stretched from that corner basically to the Jones Falls, which is now no longer a river. It's, a, it's a, basically a highway. Um, and it was right there. So it was right across the, the river or stream from the downtown area um, and you know, very close to the center town where most of the wealthy uh, folks in Baltimore lived at that time. Just there is, we have been able to recreate a floor plan from that house. And here's an example of it. Um, I'm not sure we're seeing the bottom of this, but the, the second plan from the left is what the first floor would be like, a very typical Baltimore row house at the period. You enter a hall, there are, there are parlors, um, there's a wonderful description by a Charlestonian visiting the Catons um, and talks about a party that those two rooms were filled with 50 people. They were probably about 18 by 18, so they weren't huge, but they were large, uh, but filled with um, um, 50 people and that they say that the rooms were thrown into one by folding doors, which is why we have a, shown a large doorway there. So that would have been one of their principal dining uh, entertaining spaces, but also as many Baltimoreans did in this period, the front room on the second floor, which is um, the second plan from the right, uh, was used as a drawing room. So this was a very large, you know, 25 foot long room, probably 18, 20 feet deep, uh, that in these, in these kind of uh, federal period houses was very grand because it could span the entire front of the house. And then uh, there's chambers upstairs and, and then the back buildings would, would have been used for um, cooking and where servants lived uh, in the various houses. So it was, it was a large, modest house, not a super grand house, but it was, um, you know, it was substantial and obviously their father owned it, so it was free, uh, which is always, always, always a bonus. And then lastly, I think we have one more slide here. Um, in this kind of where Marianne is living. Um, in around 1800, um, Charles Carroll of Carrollton gave Mary Carroll Caton, Richard and Richard Caton, uh, the estate known as Brooklynwood and had a house built for them there. It's been greatly expanded over time. Um, but they would have spent time there. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to tell if they were in, in, in residence full year round or if it was just kind of temporary or, I mean, most people, um, this is, if you all know, this is where the St. Paul's school is today. Uh, this is really quite a hike from downtown. Um, most of the country seats that were country seats were, you know, they were like a five to 10 minute carriage ride from downtown, but this is definitely farther than that. It's, you know, really twice as far as Homewood House. Um, so it it's hard to tell if they were there you know, weeks on end, or if they just, if we'd go out for the weekend. I know Robert Gilmore, for instance, his house Beach Hill was slightly west of the city, and he would just go out there for lunch and come back. So it it really depended how close your your house was into town. So <clears throat> um, we know that they were there, the the Catons as well as Marianne and Robert, uh, when when Marianne and Robert were married in 1806, I think the, the Catons were called uh, Brooklynwood. 
And actually when Robert Patterson died in 1822, um, he actually died at Brooklyn Woods. So they had either gone out for the fresh air or happened to be there at the time of his very early death. So if we could advance to the next slide. So where should we go with this slide, Mark? This is a fun one. Well, I guess it's the big question of, you know, who is Thomas Lawrence and why is it important to us? What, why, why is it, you know, the fact that this painting of Marianne Caton by Lawrence is in Baltimore and what is the significance of that, you know, nationally uh, and also internationally for, for us? Yes, yeah, so I would say internationally. Um, <clears throat> at the time that Marianne is painted in 1817, um, Lawrence had really just received a major commission in 1814, the Prince Regent of England at the time, I think he yeah, was Prince Regent at the time, um, later George IV, he had just commissioned Lawrence to paint all of the allied sovereigns of Europe who had defeated the French uh, during the Napoleonic Wars. This is 1814. Um, and so he was going to be going off on this trip to paint all of these heads of state. And so, you know, his not only had this British fame, but he had this emerging international fame by this commission. Now, then in March of 1815, uh, Napoleon comes back to power and then he is finally defeated permanently by the Duke of Wellington and his forces at Waterloo. Um, so the commission had been ongoing, but it hadn't really started yet. Um, and so that, that's 1815 when, and then here's Marianne meeting the Duke of Wellington in 1817, two years after this, you know, an amazingly important battle in, in European history um, and, is, and is in their circle uh, and able to have her portrait painted. You just didn't, you know, walk up to Sir Thomas Lawrence's door and say, sir, will you paint my portrait? I mean, you had to have access through very well-connected people like the Duke of Wellington. Now, this is the Waterloo Chamber at Windsor Castle where eventually all of these full-length portraits of the heads of state were displayed. If some of you will see that on the, to the right of the fireplace there, there is a portrait of the Prince Regent. Um, that might look familiar to some folks here in Baltimore because there is a version of that at the Baltimore Museum of Art that was owned by Mary Frick uh, Jacobs. And was given as part of her collection to the museum. And these portraits by Sir Thomas Lawrence uh, were really important to the Gilded Age collectors. Um, it was, it, they were thought to embody the kind of uh, Regency uh, refinement and, and glamor um, that the Regency period, you know, based on its portrait seems to have possessed this time period of, you know, obviously Jane Austen. Um, and as they've always had a strong appeal um, because, I mean, they're a, they're beautiful art objects, but they also evoke a very uh, genteel and elegant age. So Marianne, um, what museum is this slide? This is Thomas Lawrence. This, the, this is, we're looking at, um, this is the Waterloo Chamber at Windsor Castle. Um, if, what is amazing though here in Baltimore, if we go to the next slide, is that not only did Mary Ann bring home her own portrait that she'd commissioned and the Duke of Wellington that he had given to her, but that other Baltimoreans were painted by Sir Thomas Lawrence um, in the same time period. Uh, at the upper left, uh, Robert Gilmore Jr., who you mentioned was one of the founders of the Maryland Historical Society, and his wife, Sarah, were painted by Sir Thomas Lawrence in 1818, um, eight, so like the year after Mary Ann was. Um, once again, very elegant. She's, you know, in a kind of a, not a similar pose, but a similar pose to the other portrait of Mary Ann. And William Hoffman was painted. He was one of the sons of Peter Hoffman who had, I think he had about eight sons, all of who were incredibly successful merchants. And some of them actually went and spent time in London in this period to act as the London agent for their houses, um, the house here in Baltimore, uh, business house. So um, that's an excellent question about Sarah Gilmore. I'm sure she'd be pleased. Um, 
so it's amazing that these there are this many Baltimore sitters by Sir Thomas Lawrence, which is in general a rare thing for American uh, sitters of the period in general, and the fact that these that these pictures were seen here and to have your portrait painted by Sir Thomas Lawrence at this time, you know, 18, 17, 18, I mean, it really meant that you were an incredibly, well, obviously you're a very wealthy person, uh, that you were very cosmopolitan. I mean, this is, this is just this amazing journey across the water um, to, to A, to be able to go to London uh, for leisure travel and to be able to dip into someone like uh, Lawrence and uh, his fame uh, as an artist at the time, and then to be able to bring these, you know, kind of personal treasures back to Baltimore. Um, so Lance, we, who would have seen this portrait here? I well, mean, that, the fact that, is that this is, yeah. I was going to say that Marianne's portrait that we've just acquired is the only one of these in a, in a public collection. The rest are still in the family. So right. it's kind of extraordinary that yes. this is the only one that one can access. Yes, well, the Duke of Wellington's back in London, so it's a little challenging to see her in the United States, but um, the other ones are still owned by uh, descendants, but that is what is amazing is when Marianne comes back, we can go to the next slide, um, we know that her portrait was with her, probably with her, her parents, because that inscription on the back says deposited with Richard Caton, um, and we know that in 1819, uh, Robert Oliver, who was one of, you know, the top five wealthiest Baltimore merchants of this period. Uh, according to his own record books, he had Rembrandt Peel, uh, who was working here and had the Peel Museum at the time. Um, he copied the Lawrence portrait for Robert Oliver. The original Lawrence is on the left, and it's believed that the Rembrandt Peel version that we're talking about is the one on the right. It's owned by the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. So clearly Marianne's very wealthy social circle um, knows about these pictures, is seeing them at private dinner parties and you know things like that. Um, what's amazing about Robert Oliver is that by the end of his life, he also owns a portrait of her. Um, we're not sure if it's after the Lawrence or not because it hasn't been identified. And he had several prints of Charles Carroll of Carrollton, which many people did because Charles Carroll of Carrollton was such a, a major uh, dignitary here in town because of his, la his role as the last signer. So, and Oliver was not Catholic, he was Presbyterian. So he just, obviously these were his social circle or people that he greatly admired. Uh, he maybe admired Wellington for Wellington's role. Uh, so there was this private uh, viewings that you know their social circle had, but then, um, Rembrandt Peel sells the Baltimore Museum to his brother Rubens Peel, and Rubens Peel in 1822 begins a series of uh, annual exhibitions. We could go to the next slide here. And this is different than what's been going on at the Peel Museum beforehand because it was largely Rembrandt Peel's own pictures and some things that he pictures, but these first four years that Rubens Peel did exhibitions 22 to 25, um, they were loan exhibitions and basically they would go out and they would do like they do today. It was a loan show. They would go out to private collections in the city and ask people if they could put their paintings on exhibit. And so, you know, there was a small fee. There was no, there were no free public museums at the time. There was, you know, minimal dollar, whatever dollar might be worth today. Uh, so quite a few people would have seen, um, the pictures, Mary Ann's uh, that she owned were, she had already left in 1823, but they were exhibited in the fall of 1823 at the Pio Museum. And as was William Hoffman, uh, the, his portrait was, was exhibited that same year. The Gilmores would be exhibited uh, a couple years later. Um, so, you know, a broad swath of upper middle class people here in Baltimore would have seen these pictures uh, through this, this very public uh, viewing that took place. Um, then there's one more way that they were seen, which was basically at the Carroll Mansion. And in, the, in 1818, Richard Caton and uh, Mary uh, bought what's now known as the Caton, the Caton Carroll House, but it was built by Henry Wilson. Um, she bought this and having lived literally across the corner for quite some time, a much grander house, one of the grandest houses of the period. Uh, certainly one of the grandest houses of this kind of 1810 period to survive here in Baltimore. And they had, you know, large parties here. Um, 
uh, you know, for their circle. But then um, as of the late twenties, Charles Carroll of Carrollton um, ends up spending his winters here with his daughter. Um, and because in 1826, Thomas Jefferson and John, uh, John Adams died on uh, the 4th of July that year, uh, leaving Charles Carroll of Carrollton as the only uh, living signer of the Declaration, a lot of people came to see the Catons and to visit him because he was thought to be this, you know, he wasn't thought to be, he was this oracle of the American Revolution and the last one who was alive at the time. And uh, a number of visitors from, you know, the United States and, and abroad um, left visitor accounts. And I just wanted to kind of maybe talk about a couple of them because they're really great images. Um, what's really frustrating about this house, I'm working on a book about early Baltimore townhouses, is that despite the fact that it survives, uh, there is no inventory for this house. When uh, Richard and Mary Caton lived there, they were all kind of well, Richard Caton's finances were a mess. And and Mary, his wife, Mary Carroll, um, and when she died, it, it, things are kind of fuzzy as far as, uh, you know, what is in what houses that they own. So unfortunately, we, uh, we know that the principal rooms for entertaining were on the second floor, the, what's called the Piano Nobile, um, just because of their size and their decor and their trim. Um, so the question is like, where were these, certainly these pictures that Marianne deposited with her parents were likely on display at the, yeah, on the second floor. If we go to the next slide, <clears throat> Marianne herself in 1826 uh, commissions a portrait by Thomas Sully of her uh, grandfather that would eventually be sent to her. Um, and, and Thomas Sully made a number of studies uh, for it, including actually visiting Charles Carroll at the Carroll Mansion. And there's two little watercolor studies. This one here on the right is uh, at the Walters Art Museum, actually, and the other is at Princeton. And I, I love this, this account, and I'm going to just read this, sorry. Um, so any number of visitors mentioned that they see portraits of the Duke of Wellington and Mary Ann on display here. But one Captain Alexander in the late 20s said, I found the venerable patriarch quite alone and seemingly musing. The apartment was lofty, the furniture of an antique fashion and family pictures on the walls. It was night, wax lights were on the table <clears throat> and a clear fire blazed on the hearth. The old gentleman dressed in a dark purple gown was seated in a high back chair. And it is amazing to me that this visitor account almost exactly describes what, what Sully's little sketch shows. I don't know if you can see, but behind this Chippendale style chair he's in, um, there is a fire in the hearth there. And above the fireplace, there's clearly some of gilded um, framed object. It's hard to tell if it's a portrait or something else, but <clears throat> this was this very uh, rich setting, I think, and everyone noticing the series of family portraits was a very common thing. Um, I believe that this, <clears throat> excuse me, if we could go to the next slide, I think that this sketch is uh, created in the what's the back right parlor of the house, largely because of the, the where the fireplace is positioned and the way that the light is coming from the left, which this is the only room of the main three on that floor where, um, where, that, where that particular scenario of a fireplace and light coming from the direction it is would have taken place. So this is just kind of one little snapshot into what you know, people saw when they saw these portraits of uh, the Duke of Wellington. And, and there were many other visitors to the house, just one other, just kind of we can talk about a little later. Um, visitors said they have a very delightful house and a very handsome establishment, um, no less than three servants in livery. So it took a very large staff to maintain and run a house at this scale that uh, Richard and Mary Caton lived in. And then obviously Marianne, when she's probably staying with them briefly after, when, uh, before she goes back to Europe in 1823. Uh, um, and so there were people seeing it here too. Now, you know, it's obviously very, it's much more private than a, a Peel Museum exhibition in the 1820s, but uh, a lot of people commented on them and they especially commented on the two portraits by Lawrence because 
you know, even Americans and visitors knew that those were very special items. Um, just so you Lance, all know. That, so yeah. uh, I, no, I was saying, I know that we're clear, start closing in on the Q&A part, but I know that you had wanted to talk a little bit about the frame uh, yes. of Marianne's painting, because I know yep. that you have spent many years studying frames. Yeah, so just quickly, this is this is fun and fascinating to me, uh, and it, you know, I think of I think of paintings as uh, objects that live in space, as opposed to we were so used to seeing paintings as these flat images on a printed page, but they, you know, they they really are objects, and and especially the frames are decorative arts objects. The interesting thing about uh, just the point about Marianne is that she survives in a very old frame, um, but it's it's not the original frame, in my opinion. It's probably, an, it's an 18th century uh, English style Rococo frame. It's kind of hard to tell in the form, but you see all these kind of curly cues and cutouts there. Um, however, uh, the portrait that she owned of Duke of Wellington, and I'm sorry, there's a person um, standing in front of it, but at least they're in matching costumes. Um, ah. It's very, very hard to, get photographs of paintings in their frames. It just is, it, it's not often done by museums. Um, I believe he is in his original frame. Uh, a rather uh, complicated for 1818. Uh, the English, I think, were British were ahead of us in frame style as they were in furniture, uh, pushing the envelope going. I mean, the neoclassical period is clearly ended in this image as far as that frame with all these kind of Rococo style elements elements. And um, what what is interesting is just kind of quickly comparing some other images. If we go to the next slide, um, <clears throat> Sarah Gilmore, also like Marianne uh, Caton Patterson, she came on the American market in the early 20th century and also was reframed into a kind of 18th century English Rococo style frame. Um, I think that they thought that these women needed these kind of delicate, uh, you know, well, Rococo feeling, uh, that that was kind of feminine. I know that's not great to use that term, but it will make sense when I show you the next slide, which is <clears throat> Robert Gilmore, the pair to Sarah. Um, he actually survives in his original frame, if we could switch to that. There we go. And I'm sorry, this is only a little snippet of it, but, um, you can see the, the I've sized the pictures in this slide. Uh, the paintings are the same size and in real life, and they are here on this slide. And you can see how wide and kind of massive his frame is. And that if you imagine Sarah in a similar uh, wide frame, that would have, it's just this huge presence, uh, very, very big and massive. And uh, what's fun about this little project to me is that um, this frame on Gilmore is the same design, if we could go to click to the next slide, um, as the portraits on Wellington and another portrait of Wellington from the same period um, that was on exhibition at the, uh, in, at the National Portrait Gallery in London about five years ago. Once again, there's people in it because they're never real photographs of the frames by themselves. But these are 1818 and um, 19, and they're they're just way they're way more rococo than uh, an American frame would be in this period. The American frames were still a little bit more neoclassical in this time, um, and so and really I do think that the rococo style kind of snuck into American uh, design through frames. I think it was some of the earliest ones. And just one last slide about this is to compare that that frame there on the left with uh, the one on Gilmore for the non-believers in the group. If we could switch to the next slide. Um, you can see here that these, they have the absolute same identical ornamentation on them, this kind of little uh, rokai leaf in the middle and the, and the little curly cues uh, coming off of the S-shaped uh, florals. And so I would imagine that when Marianne first arrived here in the United States, she was in a frame that would have matched uh, that of the Duke of Wellington, um, a very, you know, bold frame. And it's it's kind of a neat story about perceptions of what what a frame looks like. You know, who knows, it could have been beat up in the 1920s and they wanted to replace it. But it also, I think, has to do with the, the style and thinking that something more feminine uh, and delicate was appropriate to the portrait of a woman at the time. <clears throat> 
There were no boy and girl just... frame. There were there were no boy and girl frames in the past. I just want to put that out there. So anyway. I think that uh, this has been truly fascinating. And I know you and I could go hours just talking about this subject, but I thought we would open it up a little bit now to some questions uh, that are, I'm sure, coming through, not only in the chat, but I believe sure. Margo has some questions that she may want to, uh, to share. I know that um, one of the ones that I saw here was, uh, you know, where was the painting before it came to us? Uh, I can answer that really quickly. It, was, it had been in the estate for the last 50 years. And the estate, um, when they were settling the estate, they approached this institution, and that's how we, that's how we acquired it. Can I, and can I just add to that quickly, Mark? That so these, sure. both of these paintings ended up going back to England. Um, <clears throat> the portrait of the Duke of Wellington was in um, Mary Carol Caton's inventory on and the Caton House on Lombard Street. Um, but not the portrait of Marianne. They often didn't include family portraits in um, estates, uh, which is confusing and annoying. Um, but Mary, Mary Ann will, willed both of them to uh, family members in England. And so they both went back to England and then ended up descending in families, uh, one to the Duke of Wellington and uh, the one in another family that eventually uh, her own portrait put it on the American market in the 19, I think in the 1920s or 30s. So they went back and then now Marianne came back. Came back here. Wonderful. So, you're muted, Margo. So thank you, Mark. <laughs> um, so I do see a lot of questions in our Q&A. Um, in our Q&A function on Zoom. And if people aren't familiar, it's at the bottom of your screen. So plug in some questions if you have them for Mark and Lance. Um, can you, one question I know that's out there is that, can you speak toward the sharing of portraits um, at this time? I know you mentioned a little bit that it was a token of, um, a token of, uh, usually a smaller token, a smaller portrait. Um, but what is happening between this connection between the Duke of Wellington and Marianne Caton Patterson? Well, that's the that's the million dollar question. Um, it because it it you know it really was something that especially miniatures that were exchanged between you know or you know a, a parent and a child or having a miniature painted of your father from a portrait after he died or something. It was, you know, very, uh, miniatures are, in general are very personal because they're small. Um, but it, it, it typically was a really, really, you know, intimate relationship unless you, um, you know, unless you were just buying something for, uh, you know, you're buying your very patriotic American in 1820, like Robert Gilmore Jr. And you want a portrait of George Washington, and you know, so you commission one. So that, that there's no, I mean, he, I think he met him once, but it wasn't that he was a friend. It was he admired his, you know, his politics and what he did for the country. So this this exchange of portraits is, um, I don't want to say it's not unprecedented, but it it's just it it's certainly in light of and and. You know, I'm I'm not an expert on all of the Sisters of Fortune and everything that they did because they did a lot, um, but it, it it is I think let's say it's unusual that a grand scale you know these are 25 by 30 I think portraits um, very public because it's big. What's interesting is if you consider that when Marianne Patterson had this painted and he had her painted that you know the Duke of Wellington had her painted she was still married to Robert she comes back. She comes right. back, marries the Duke's brother, Arthur Wellesley, who was the Viceroy of Ireland. Right. But the interesting thing is, Wellington is upset when she, he, she marries his brother, yet he's married. So we yeah. don't really understand all of what's going on there, but it's definitely, there's, there's more there. We just don't have never really, there's no evidence that anything else developed, like you said earlier, but it is a fascinating, I mean, she is his sister-in-law. Yeah, and, and what is Robert Patterson doing while he's saying like, why is he, why is the Duke of Wellington having my wife painted? I mean, you know, you know. Exactly, I think it's, 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 it's a really- it's, un, it's unusual, it is unusual. It is, 
Yeah. And I don't think there's, I don't think there, not much survives about Robert. He's kind of an enigma, I think, as he dies young for one. And um, there, there's some quotes that he was not a great traveler and maybe, maybe he wasn't social. And so he's not, you know, he didn't want to participate in the, the world that they, the W-H-I-R-L world that they were in of social life in London. Uh, but he doesn't kind of emerge as having strong feelings about this, but we may just not know about them. Lance, something else that I was curious, and Martha, I, don't, I mean, Margo, I'm not sure if you were going to ask something, but you mentioned something about servants and, and, uh, and livery earlier. Yes. Well, that quote about livery is very unusual. I, I, as I mentioned, I'm working on a book about Baltimore townhouses from 1780 to 1860. And I think I might have two references to people in town um, having their servants dressed in livery. That was just very unusual, um, very rare. And even the comment that I, I had, um, she says, uh, Mrs. Hall, she says, I had not seen a servant in livery in this country and you cannot think how grand it appears to me. So even this you know, person from England knew that seeing having servants in livery was just uh, very rare. Uh, which you know, I mean, these it's interesting that in our in our spectrum of fashion exhibition, our fashion exhibition right now, we have two examples of livery: one from Hampton Mansion, uh, the Ridgeleys, and the other one uh, from Mount Clare, you know, from Charles Carroll the Barrister's home. So it's interesting yeah. that we have two right now, and that exhibit's still up to the end of March uh, to show these examples of livery, which is extremely rare in Maryland. Yeah, or sailing in the United mm -hmm. States. Yeah. And we just put in the chat uh, a link to the uh, livery for the enslaved man um, in our chat. So you can take a look at that while we're discussing it. Oh, cool. Um, well, I will mention, since you just mentioned that, that, I mean, we, we do know that um, the Kate and Carols uh, and really the Patterson family, I mean, they, they, they and really most of Baltimore's merchant wealth did run their households with enslaved labor. It, 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 was, it was very commonplace amongst the, the richest people in town. They either had um, slaves, some of them used enslaved labor with, with some free black labor. And really the only exceptions to that here in town are um, the Qu Quakers, um, but in the 1790 to 1830, I know from just this work I've been doing on this townhouse project that um, this was very, it was just very common. And the Catons, certainly, I think I have that they had um, 10 slaves in their house in 1820. So when they say that, you know, they have a large staff to run this house, I mean, they did, even if you had free white labor, free black labor, it, it's still, I mean, it took an amazing number of people, at least five typically, to run a house, uh, you know, cooks and maids. And uh, we don't live in a world here in the United States where cooks and maids are very common. And so it, it's kind of hard to imagine all these people, um, you know, the household might have a family of seven parents and five kids, and then there'd be like seven servants of some kind. I mean, there were a lot of people living in these houses in this period. Um, I think that's going to be an interesting uh, kind of side story to my book coming out of, of who was working in these houses for the, the richest class here in Baltimore. Um, Mark, what, what actually does this acquisition of this portrait of Mary Ann Caton Patterson mean for, the, for MCHC? What does it mean for us and, and our collection? I think that it gives us, um, it's an internationally important acquisition. You know, it does bring together two worlds. It brings, you know, the European world. It brings together that early part of the 19th century. It talks about expatriates early on, way before um, the end of the 19th century, when generally this is uh, more commonplace. So I think it, it's, you know, I am particularly proud that it came to our institution because it's the only one, as I said earlier, in public, uh, in a public situation. I know that the Duke of Wellington, but he is English, is at Apsley House in London, uh, but this is the only one uh, of an American or at least of an expatriate American in a public collection for Maryland. So very exciting. Um, it's the first work by Sir Thomas Lawrence in our collection, and I'd like to think it's not the last, 
But uh, as we can see, there's still some other Marylanders out there that I would love to add to the to the collection. But I think it gives and, us an international international plug. Yeah, and, and I would add to that, Mark. That um, I mean, Sir Thomas Lawrence has been you know a, recognized for a century as an important British artist. Uh, you, know, you know, maybe since he was alive, he was considered important. But as far as American collecting and museums, certainly since the Gilded Age, Sir Thomas Lawrence has been um, just, you know, you have to have a Sir Thomas Lawrence to kind of flesh out your history of British painting. And I think what it just is amazingly unique about this situation yeah. is that, for instance, uh, the Huntington Museum out in uh, California, uh, from the Huntington collection, they have the famous Pinky, who is by um, Lawrence, and it's paired with a Gainsborough Blue Boy. But you know, that's just some random person by the that Sir Thomas Lawrence painted, and is now in a California collection. But the fact that this picture of a Baltimorean, uh, they're they're just they're so rare of American sitters for that to be able to come home to Baltimore is really special because it could have gone anywhere. Uh, you know, it could be in Florida or something like that where it didn't have as much resonance. And I think that um, that's, just, that's just a treat, I think, for the city that it came back here. Lance, how many, um, uh, Charles is asking, how many heads of state did Sir Thomas Lawrence end up painting and where are they dispersed now? Uh, oh, the number, I'm not sure. They, the, most of them are hanging in that Waterloo chamber. If you Google Waterloo chamber, uh, Windsor Castle. I think I, I want to say maybe 10. Uh, I'm not completely positive because there's pictures in that room that are not all part of that series, but it was, it was, uh, I would say eight to eight to 10 that he painted. And, and I think, I think most of them are still in, in that chamber. Well, you both, I think can talk more and more. There's many, many questions in our chat and in our Q and A. Um, that are would I would love to have answered today. Um, that takes us all over the place. But I think that we're going to have to say thank you for uh, joining us, Lance, and having this conversation with Mark. It really was very lovely, and we are so happy to have you again, Lance, with us. And everyone out there, thank you for joining us. Thank you for donating. We couldn't do this free program without you. I encourage you to take a look and um, donate uh, today if you if you feel like that's something that you can do. Join us next month for our next FSK from home. It is Saving America's Treasures, Preserving Daguerreotypes in our collection with a conservator, Zach Long. So that will be just as, as engaging and as intriguing as this conversation was. So we will see you then. And thank you, Mark and Lance. And thank you, everyone out there. Thank you, Mark and Lance. Thank you. Thank you.